first came uh, to New York from Canada, I believe I once heard you remark that uh, card magic was uh, at a very crude kind of uh, state, uh, that uh, there were uh, not really very many uh, skilled card handlers uh, doing magic. Maybe there were some uh, gamblers uh, who uh, knew some things, but uh, uh, from uh, the books I read and uh, the people uh, that uh, write about you, it seems that uh, you're the guy who uh, is credited with uh, having uh, really promoted and uh, analyzed uh, and even designed uh, a lot of present-day card handling. Well, I wouldn't take credit for that because there was a, a Dr. James W. Elliott, a Harvard graduate, a very clever doctor who absolutely gave up practice and he was had a mania for cards and he devoted his life to it. Dr. James William Elliot, he, in fact, he issued a challenge to anybody in the world to meet him with a, uh, for $10,000 or $5,000, I think it was $5,000. Money values have changed since then, but I think it was $5,000, any man in the world to meet him with a regular pack of cards and the, they had to do 10 original things and 10 standard moves. And he, but nobody accepted his challenge, although Clinton Burgess and uh, a fellow named Barney Ives, two other magicians, were very anxious to challenge him, but they couldn't raise them $5,000. But uh, Dr. Elliott was the only magician that I met in New York in those days that handled a regulation pack of cards. All the magicians in those days used to use a euchre pack of 32 cards, which are 20 cards removed. So. The pack, in the old Hoffman books, in old Professor Hoffman, he advised in, 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 in the books, the Modern Conjure, More Conjure, uh, in the old days, <clears throat> he had advised the use of 32 cards because he said 52 were much too bulky to handle. And when I first met Dr. Edith, he said, well, young man, he said, you use a full pack of cards. It was quite unusual in those days to use a full pack. I mean, they, cause, of course, euchre was very prevalent. There several well, was euchre a French deck originally? No, well, there is. I forgot the name yeah. of the French. There are several French games that use 32 cards. And the game that Damon Runyon used to write about all the time, Clabriash, Clabriash, is it's K-L-A-B-B-E-R-J-A-S. It's a funny, but it's pronounced Clob. They, they call it Clob. Now that's a very beautiful two-handed game, much superior to gin or, or any of these games. It's a very wonderful game, and it's funny that very few people play it. Now, most of the people who play it think it's of Hungarian origin, but I've read that it's not of Hungarian origin. But anyway, it's a very beautiful game, but it's played with 32 cards. In other words, all below the sevens are removed. But in the old days, <clears throat> Al Altman, who was the Metro Golden Scout for MGM, he was Mayor, H.P. Mayor's secretary, <coughs> He did some beautiful work with cards in those days, but he always used 32 cards. In, in, in other words, the well-known Soviet the coup or the past, as known as a shift and to, the, <coughs> to the magicians, <coughs> is so much easier to make with 32 cards than it is with a full pack, and they all use 32 cards. And everybody would remark in those days, am I going to use a full pack of cards? This was, they thought they were unwieldy, you know. Excuse me, that's, but that's like uh, if you're practicing. But that, that, oh, oh, yeah. that was owing to the fact that Hoffman, who was the father, you might say, or I don't know, the, you know, of the arts, I mean, his books are still standard today, one very wonderful books were written years ago, but he advised strongly the use of 32 cards, so the students reading those books took his word for it. I was going to say, practicing a second deal or something like that is easier with... Well, a bottom uh, deal, much easier. Bottom deal, yeah, easier. All the books used to say, of course, that bottom deal dealing becomes much simpler when you get to reduce, well, to reduce it right down to two cards. You can see if you have two cards, it's just as easy to take the bottom right. one as the top. Right. So right. in other words, it goes right. proportionately up because sure. the, the yeah. difficulty increases yeah. the yeah. more cards sure. you have. But uh, this this is rather strange. That nowadays, I, you never see anybody do tricks with only 32 cards. I mean, they'd, they'd say, where are the rest of the cards, you know? But in those days, it was quite accepted. Right. It's, it's rather right. interesting about cards. But, uh, of course, as I say, uh, card technique, uh, in my opinion, since the days of Hofsenzer and, and some of the old time really great magicians with cards, the effects were, haven't been, I, I don't think, I, in my life, I think I said in the last program that Paul Curry's out of this world where the uh, spectator segregates the red card and yes. the black card, is one of the few absolutely new effects in my lifetime. because. 
When I, it may be a new effect if you use two sevens instead of two fours. That's not a new effect. The effect is the same. If, or uh, you make whether you make queens jump from one place to another or, or jacks. What's the difference? It's the same effect. Mm -hmm. Although some people might say, well, it's more effective to make jacks jump than fours or threes, mm -hmm. but it's the same trick. And a card appearing face up in the pack, whether it appears face up in a complete pack or only in a in a batch of four or five cards, the effect is the same. A card turns reverses itself. So I mean, effects are very, very rare, but the methods of it, oh, they've that's it almost become, methods are yeah, really advanced yeah. to a yes. very high yeah. degree. The methods of doing things a refinement upon yeah, a refinement. Yes. In the old days, when they make this saute la coupe, which in slow motion is is a, is a method of cutting cards. Of course, you can just cut cards like this, but mechanically, the cards are cut with a little finger in there and cut that way. Now, this is done. I'm just doing it in slow motion, like that. That's known as saute la coupe or jump the cut saute la coupe is jump the cut or that's a French or the pass and, the, and and some people call it the shift all all magicians call that a pass and there are many ways of cutting cards I mean cards can be cut this way they can be cut this way many different ways and as a matter of fact I think I know 36 different ways of cutting a pack of cards now the reason this is but there's been more thought put on methods of cutting cards than anything else is because in a card game cards are cut Always, it, and it is an old saying: "Put your faith in providence, but always have, always cut the cards," which is true. No matter how skillfully a gambler might run up a hand so he'd get a royal flush or a straight, if the cards are cut, that destroys his run-up or his setup. That he's now. So there's been a lot of thought on on killing that. In other words, bringing the cards back the way they were. Now, of course, as I say, if cards are cut like this, I'm doing it very openly, and the cards are, this is done like this, naturally the, car, the cards are back the way they were before the cut. Or the cards can be cut like this and picked up like this. Now they're the same way again. You see, I'll do that face up and you'll see what I mean. See, the four is on top. Now the five should be the card on top, but the five goes under, underneath. It's hard to do. I'll put the ace here. It'd be easier to see. Put the ace here. Now, when I cut the cards, that five should be on top, but the cards are picked up this way with a sweep, so they go back. Now that's another way of circumventing the cut. But there are numbers of ways of doing this. Now this is these, this. Uh, the reason there's been so much thought put on this, not only by magicians, because magicians use this move to bring a card from the center to the top of the pack, but gamblers you want to use it to make money. They eh? so there's been a lot of thought put on. But any equation, any time there's a lot of money to be made, there's been a lot of thought put on. Well, gamblers through the ages have tried different ways of overcoming the cut. Now, there's another funny way of overcoming a cut. Now, this is, supposing here we got the two of hearts on the top. Now, the cards are cut like this, cards are cut, and you accidentally drop a few when you go back for them, and that leaves the pack back in order. So there are many ways of accomplishing this. I mean, this is, this, I mean, I could talk for probably hours on just doing nothing but circumventing that cut. That's okay. But anyway, that, uh, there are many ways to do it. But that's just one branch of cards. I mean, there's second dealing, there's bottom dealing, there's third dealing, there's dealing from the center of the pack. Did you practice endlessly uh, in those years uh, with... Uh, well, no, with I, I was more in the creative end. Uh, yes. See, I'm, I'm a will-o'-the-wisp, I suppose. Uh, I, I've, uh, any, anything you take up, I've, I, I've been very... I'm, I know a real jack of all trades because any time I saw anything that was clever, whether it was an acrobat or a tightrope walker or a fancy diver or anything in gymnastics, I always tried to, to, to perform it. Now once I got fairly proficient at it, then I'd run to something else. Yeah. I was interested in photography yeah, well, and, and, and electricity and all the things I remember built up. When first Marconi discovered wireless, I saw directions in some boy's own paper how to make a wireless. And I was just so excited, even in a room, when I got the little ticker to respond without any wires. I thought this was a real miracle. I mean, but I, I was always interested in anything. But all through, the, magic has a peculiar fascination. Because I think you're, you're striving for perfection, and perfection can't be reached. I mean, I mean you can't, yes. you're always short of perfection. <coughs> the nearer you approach perfection, the more you feel you achieve yes. something. And anybody who's been in any kind of art or learning, I don't care whether it's violin or piano, it, there's a great feeling of achievement. I mean, for you're not, I'm not talking about commercial, I hate that word commercial, because 
after all, all the hard use is commercial, I suppose. I don't think he's a very happy man. Yeah. But I really believe that achieving, it's just like a kid waiting for Christmas. When you finally, Christmas comes, it's a little bit disillusioning. But it's not so with magic. You, can't, you can never reach that s saturation point in magic because you can't reach perfection. There's no such thing. But you can, the closer sure. you come to perfection and attaining and creating an effect, the more pleased inwardly you are yeah. yourself. Sure. And I think every artist has that same feeling. Yeah, I think that's true. The last time we uh, talked, uh, I know you said something that uh, uh, I uh, think was uh, uh, so very uh, apropos to uh, the creative person, and that was that uh, uh, don't you, uh, I believe you said uh, uh, something very close to this, uh, uh, don't you find that uh, you can take a narrow your field down to a point where you uh, have really a very small audience after a while. And, uh, Absolutely, I'm sure you really that's, have uh, no audience. If you go, uh, no audience. you get too good, you're your own, yeah. and you, you can pass right. everybody. And I'm sure that's as true with magic, uh, maybe particularly card magic, as well as anything else. You can just simply refine it to the point where uh, the uh, the audience, particularly the layman, uh, is almost lost as to what even the effect is. The great Hofsinger, who is, to me, as an I course, that was way before my time, but in Vienna, he was a way, way ahead of everybody, and he died a very bitter man. In fact, he got his wife to destroy every written memorandum he had, and she loved him very dearly, and she did. And so the only uh, things we have are things that come to us secondhand from his pupils, which he had two or three pupils. But uh, he just got bitter because uh, it's a strange thing when you, uh, well, or, I don't know, uh, that's, I can't go into that too much to discuss, but, but it's a strange thing when you spend a lot of time and thought on something and perhaps I mean, a little simple thing, perhaps it's taken you seven or eight years to, to finally bring the thing to simplicity. I mean, what was it Leonardo said? Uh, uh, details make for perfection, but perfection is no detail. And I always thought what a great thing saying that was because things get complicated, complicated, but after they become beautiful, they're simple. They're, they're, the effect is there without all the complications. And what annoys me, and I think it would annoy anybody, is after spending perhaps five or six years, not working constantly, but every adding a little idea, and finally you bring a certain trick to a form that's pure and without clutter and being cluttered, and you show it to somebody, they say, well, of course, how else? I mean, how else would you do it? As if it's an obvious thing. Well, a lot of the greatest inventions, after you know them, they're obvious, but but that's the yes. same with magic. Yes. It's a little annoying when you show a fellow something, you say, show me that, show me that. And you show him, you say, well, of course, that's the way I do it. I, we wouldn't do it that way at all without going through years of experiments. Yes. But it's, it's a little disconcerting. Oh, that reminds me of a question I have to ask you. Is it really true that uh, you invented a, a card move that was so perfect that uh, you would never show it to anybody? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there are a few. Yeah, well, I had a friend uh, who called himself Muhammad Bay. That was a fictitious name in New York. He, he, he looked a little bit. He had lips that resemble an Egyptian. And I've wife, seen pictures of him. Yeah, my wife suggested, said, well, you should be, uh, build yourself as a Muhammad and call yourself Muhammad because your lips are very much like an Egyptian. And he did, and he, he even fooled uh, on the ships going to South America one day, the chief engineer, Mr. Link, an elderly man, got quite a kick out of it because Sam, Sam, Sam Horowitz was his right name. He spoke English very well. But uh, he introduced uh, uh, Muhammad Bey to two sisters uh, that were on the ship and two nuns. And so Sam said, very, very glad to know you, uh, sister. And she said, oh, he speaks English. The chief, the chief got a big kick out of that because like, he used to pretend he, was, he worked sure. in Panama. I mean, they yeah. thought he was Egyptian. Really, he wasn't Egyptian. This was amusing. But when, to Sam, I said, my, he speaks English. And they were quite flabbergasted that he could speak English. They thought he, so that shows he was pretty good. But he was the one, I, I went off on a tangent. He was the one that used to say to me sometimes when I'd show him some little dinky thing, he'd say, you know, he said, this is so great, I, I'm afraid even to think about it. He, he, did, he thought the thought would be conveyed to people. As an illustration of that, there's a trick which I think I was the first to utilize in which a card has backs on both sides. In other words, the card is made like that. It's printed so that it has backs I on see. both sides. Now, I used to use this in several ingenious tricks because nobody suspected that there were some trick cards in the old days that used to be printed on both sides so you'd have a card that was fake like that. But the, I made use of this trick, which incidentally was Hofsinger used it for an entirely different reason. He used to use double back cards sometimes. 
But he had a trick where the cards used to jump out and fall on the floor. Well, naturally, all of that fluttered to the floor, they'd always fall face down because there was no face. I mean, this was, well, I loved that principle when I was a boy. Because <laughs> I thought, what a daring thing. These cards flop, fly out of his pocket and fall on the floor, and they all fall face down. Well, this was a subtlety that he utilized because any thinking person would say, well, they must have been the right cards because they, they might have fallen face up. Sure. What happened was, these all fluttered out of his pocket, and he, had, he put these cards in his pocket before the trick commenced. He said, I'll put three cards in my pocket before the trick commences. And he put these three cards, apparently, but they were all double back cards. He put them in this upper pocket here, and then he had three cards selected, which he, by that pass I was talking about, sure. he brought them all to the top of the pack. He brought these cards, now for instance here, he brought, we'll say, we'll just say for instance that these were the cards, uh, uh, here, a four, eight, and a nine, we'll say. These are the cards, a four, eight, and a nine. Now these cards were brought to the top. Now he made a snap and these cards jumped out and fell on the floor. Of course, they all fell face down, <laughs> face down. Now he picked them up and he said, wouldn't, and he, he picked them up and with a gesture, he exchanged them for these cards and he said, wouldn't it be funny if these were the cards and showed these other cards? Well, naturally, people would think they must have been the cards because they might have fallen face up. Uh, and then sure. he, so this was a subtlety that yeah, I admired. Yeah, yeah. So and then I thought, yeah. I wonder what other ways a double back card can be used with two backs. Now, what other ways? So I came up with a great many different ways of using this card. And getting back to Muhammad Bey, I used to fool him very badly with using this principle. And one time he said, won't you please show me that? Please show me that. And I said, well, here. And I gave him a card, one of these cards in his hand. And he just held it like that. He said, no, don't tease me. Please show me. I said, well, I'm showing you, Sam. He said, you're not showing me anything. So he handed me the card back, and I put it back. And I did another trick, and I said, there's the secret, Sam, and I handed him the card. Never once did he turn the card over, and he, he kept saying, please don't tease me. So finally, I reached over and turned it in his hand, and he, he took a startled look, and he said, gee whiz. But he still didn't know how I was using it, but he said, oh, I'd be even afraid to think about this. I mean, he, he, he liked the idea so much. You see. That's but, I mean, that's just a little yeah, illustration yeah, of what I'm talking about. about. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, also a uh, real insight into the psychology of uh, the observer, because uh, so often I think uh, the magician uh, maybe thinks that people are going to see him do something that, uh, uh, of course, they never see him do. Well, I'll uh, tell you, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. See, I very, I never forget, uh, when I was a young boy, I went with my father on a fishing trip. I mean, we went up in the mountains in Canada, went on this fishing trip, and uh, they had a poker game. My father never gambled or anything, but there were a m number of men there going on this fishing trip, seven or eight. And this night they had a, they had a, they had a, a little poker game. And I was watching them, and anyway, I selected a card. I selected a card from the, some man called me over. He said, I was only about probably eight years old. He said, Sonny, come over here, I'll show you something. And he took the cards and he had me draw a card and I put it back and, and he said, what was the name of your card? And I said, Ace of Spades, and he cut the card at the Ace of Spades. And, and I said to myself, my goodness, how did he do that? As a little boy, I thought, that's beautiful. I do some tricks, but I can't do anything so neatly as that. And I was flabbergasted, so I hounded him and kept coaxing him. He says, you're too young, Sonny, to learn this. I said, no, and I showed him a few tricks. Then when he realized that I was really interested. He did show me a few little things, and I, I remember thinking, now he was a gambler, well, although I know, when I think back now, he probably wasn't a professional gambler, but he knew some something about yes. gambling. And that gave me, I began to think, well, these gamblers, they make money out of cards. They have to be good, because a, a magician can get caught, and they say, oh, I caught you, I know how you do that. But if a gambler does something, and he's playing on a card, they don't, they, they probably throw him out of the game, or they take, don't let him win the pot. I, he's got to be good. So I had a great respect for it, although I never wanted to be a professional gambler, but I thought they have the finest methods. So I began chasing gamblers every time I'd meet one and find, trying to find out what weapons they were using. Sure. And that some of the things they do are very ingenious and beautiful. Uh, I, I hope I'm not putting you in the spot, but could, can, you demo, can you demonstrate a, uh, a whole card switch? Whole card oh, switch? Oh, yeah, there are uh, many, many different uh, kinds of I read, uh, the reason that particularly fascinates me is I read uh, uh, where uh, somebody said that uh, you uh, showed them one time 17 ways to uh, oh, switch yeah. a whole well, card. Oh yeah, I do know about 15 or 16. Uh, uh, which I'm not asking you to no, do all no, of no, now, well, but I'll I just, just, uh, just thought it might you. be... Uh, what I mean by... Uh, I'm, 
In my hand, for incident, I'm not a poor workman blames his tools, but I'm not blaming. But I, my hands are so dry now that certain things I used to do with great facility I can't do well now. But I'll try to see if I can do this one, which is a good one. I mean, for instance, uh, in the game of stud poker, in the game of stud poker, of course, having a deuce in the hole or a two in the hole is not a very good hand. But if you have concealed on your lap or in your shoe or anywhere, you have an extra card here. This is the way, uh, this is one of the ways they switch cards. Now this card here has to be switched for the two. Now the way that, is, one of the ways that is done is this. They take the card and they look at this card like this. They look at the card like this. Oh wait, excuse me. You don't mind if I put a little something in my hand? My hands are yeah, so dry. I can't, no, my hands are so dry. This is just ordinary hand lotion, but my hands are so dry I can't do these things like I used to do them <laughs> because my hands are very very dry now but anyway here's the action on this here's the card that's concealed here now you've got the two in the hole so you come over this way you, you look you apparently look at this card like this and you come over and put it here and you say all right and you see you switched in the two yeah I didn't even see it from here <laughs> well there are many ways now I mean here's a way where where it is done with vehemence, you might say. Well, you, here's a two down here. Here's a two. Now here's the ace. And they say this is for a violent type of performer. I mean, he, here you got the ace here. You say well, you, you come over like this. You say, look there. Well, see my hands dry again. But well, I'll do it again. Wait a minute. I haven't done these things for years. But here, well, I'll switch the ace for the two. You got the ace here. You come like this and you throw it down like that and switch, see? But that's another way of doing it. I have to hit you for uh, three-card money because oh, I yeah, think well, that's... Oh, yeah, well, that's... Do you want a... Uh, would you like a deck of... Uh, no, no, these of, are all... Uh, these you want are, a deck of... No, uh, these are good. Are they they, right? Any okay. card. I, I, I never used any special cards. Uh, uh, that's one thing... Uh, uh, years ago, one of the great... Uh, a fellow named Warren Keane, who was one of the finest sleight-of-hand performers I ever met. Warren Keane, Nate Leipzig, and Max Molini, Silent Mora. Those four were very interesting performers. But Warren Keene always told me, he says, Vernon, if you're going to do card tricks, he says, never use any phony cards if possible, because he says, once they catch you with phony cards, he says, your reputation is over. They say, oh, well, he uses trick cards. And, and it's true. I mean, it's, uh, it's like tricking anything else. Well, it's not it? quite cricket. Uh, not cricket, that's right. <laughs> use an old British expression. But anyway, this is, uh, these beautiful cards, by the way, were designed by my dear friend Tony and Lap, and I think they're very beautiful cards, as I say, they're beautiful design. But uh, I hope you won't be so attracted by the cards that you won't see what I'm doing here. But anyway, this is a game they used to say, they used to have a little rigmarole, they used to say, they used to say a little game from Hanky Poo, the black for me and the red for you. If you bet 10, you get 20. If you bet 20, you get 40. And in fact, you can bet any amount of money you like. And the game was very simple. All you had to do was to watch where the red card went. I can throw it here. I can throw it here. In other words, I can throw it on either side. They'd throw them down like this, and most people would see that the card went there. But some people would say it went here. Well, it didn't go there. It went where I told you, right there. You see, now I'll show you how this thing works. You see, anybody can see where that card goes, which is a single card. When I throw it down, even a little child can tell where the card drops. But when I have two cards in my hand, it's hard to see whether I throw that queen like that or whether I throw the, the top card and keep the queen. You see, because there are two cards, you have, it's a 50-50 chance to see whether I throw that one or whether I throw that one. It looks similar, so you have to watch to see which one I throw. Now, of course, if I show you which one I throw, if I show you black here and black here, a lot of people would take this card over here, but that's black, you see. That's black, and this one's black. And if they get this one, they lose because the red one's over here. Now, that's a little bit ambiguous for most people. They don't Beautiful. understand what I'm doing. So now I'll show you how they make... You see, the average person is too timid to risk money on another man's game. And every child has been told not to bet on another man's game. But a lot of avaricious people, when they think they've got the best of it, or they think they've got... They, they, they'll take advantage of it. Now, I'll give you an illustration of what I mean. Now, there are only two black cards, two black and one red. That's black and that's black, and there's only one red card. Now, when I pick the cards up, I always keep them bent a little this way so they're easy to pick up from the table. Now, naturally, you don't follow, that's black. You don't follow that, you don't follow that, you follow the red one. Now, when I throw the cards down like this, see, although I cross my hands over like that, it's hard to see where it goes. And I pick up the card and I pretend not to notice, I don't notice it because the corner's covered over, see? 
He covers it over like that. Uh, I got the bent a little here. So uh, when I pick up the card, I say, now, gentlemen, don't throw my cards around like that on the floor because they get soiled and it's easy to spot them. And I pretend. Now, I throw the cards like this, and of course the shell puts his hand over this corner right away and he, he makes a large bet on the card and he wins. Well, now, some these people that are avaricious standing around, they say, well, this is easy money, that, that the card is bent. So he says, now, I'm going to throw them again. Don't forget, that's black, this is black, and this is a red one. Now he said, I'll do it once more. Now this time, he can't get his hand, the money down fast enough because they see the bent corner, but you see he's fooled because... Now the question is, who's the honest man here? I mean, <laughs> this fellow's trying to cheat the, the operator by taking advantage of the bent corner, but he's outwitted. False shuffles, I mean, I don't do them as well as I used to, but I've, I've got these cards all arranged red and black. You see the black on separated, the colors. Now, if you take a pack of cards like that, and sh legitimately riffle them together this way. This is a riff known as a riffle shuffle. If you riffle or shuffle them together that way and then cut them, apparently they should be mixed up, but you see they're not. They're just exactly as the way they were. Now I'll do that again very slowly. I, I, you didn't know what I was gonna do, so I'll do it very slowly this time. I want you to watch every move. Push them right in like that. Cut slowly like that and like that. And you see the cards are all exactly as they were. Now, some people say, well, I mean, annoying person will say, well, I know what happens, you, you, uh, you, wait a minute, let me see, what happens, you, you uh, push them, put them together, and then you pull them out again. But look, I'll show you how slowly this can be done. The cards are put in there like that and pushed right in together. Now, to all intents and purposes, those cards are thoroughly shuffled. But when I give them this cut like that, I separate all the colors again, and they're all back the way they were. That's fantastic. Now, <clears throat> that's known as false riffle shuffling. Now, there are all kinds of false cuts, as I say. You can cut the card. Now, see on the bottom, I have the two of diamonds, and the top, I have the ace of spades. Now, I can cut like this, see? As many times as I like, I can do this, this kind of thing. And uh, the ace of spades stays there, and the two of diamonds there. Now, you can give a triple cut like this. But the two of diamonds stays there, and the ace stays here. So see, there are many ways of apparently shuffling the cards when they're not actually shuffled at all. Now another thing, sometimes when you say, well, what happens when somebody picks up the cards and, and shuffles them? They shuffle them themselves. Now somebody says, let me shuffle the cards. You say, all right, you shuffle, and they shuffle, but unbeknown, you've stolen two or three cards or a whole hand. If you want to steal a whole, if I, uh, more than five cards, you do the same thing, you put the pack down, and you've got a whole hand of cards here. So, I mean, there are many ways of doing that. Now, that's what's known as palming in the right hand, like this. You see, the cards are squared up, the deck is squared up like that and put down, and you have cards here. Now, there's another way of doing that. You can do this from the bottom, see, like that. Keep the cards in the left hand. Now, when you've got the cards in the left hand here, and you want to get them into the right hand, there's a move like this. See, you come over like that, and they transfer the cards to this hand. So there are many hundreds of different maneuvers that can be done, I mean, with cards. And these are utilized by magicians. The more weapons they have, or the more devices they have, the more tricks they're able to come up with. Because after all, there are a very limited number of basic effects. Cards can be made to rise and out of the pack. They can be made to change places. They can change color. They can, uh, red, I mean, if you have a, you can change a red back deck for uh, this blue back deck. And as I say, but there aren't more than probably the, by the wildest stretch of the imagination, I don't think you could come up with more than 20 effects, although there are thousands of tricks. There are only what you might call 20 basic effects. I mean, cards can be made to grow smaller, made, made to grow bigger. They can be made to spin. They can be made, but these are all different effects. But when after you get to 20, you'll find there are no more. I mean, at least there's some mind maybe <laughs> ingeniously to concoct some new effects, but it's very difficult. Even the electronic age I rem Yeah, there. I remember <laughs> reading once in a, in a very uh, fine book, one time it said it's harder to come up with a new effect in cards than it is to concoct a new, a new uh, proposition in Euclid. I mean, Euclid is absolutely, I mean, to come up with something brand new in, in Euclid or geometry, it's almost impossible. And the same thing with a new effect in cards. 
very difficult, a new effect. People say, oh, I saw a new trick last week, but it's not really a new, it's a, it's a variation of a well-known effect. See, after all, finding a card, I mean, it's been selected. Well, that's an, an effect, finding a card, unbeknown to the person in some way, you find a card that they selected. Well, it doesn't matter whether you find it under an ashtray or up behind <laughs> a picture on the wall or in somebody's shoe. It's still the effect of finding an unknown card. So all of the eff effect seems different. It's basically the same effect, finding an unknown card in some outlandish place or in your pocket or in your shoe, as I say, or under somebody in somebody's hat. You're still finding a card. So the, the, that's what's so difficult about magic. You're limited in the effects, but the way effects can be twisted. and Well, of course, that's the way you take eight notes in an octave on a piano, I mean, the number of variations they get are fantastic because they, by combining them endlessly you can get all kinds of different musical sounds, <coughs> harmony. So it's a very interesting thing. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by cards because it's almost endless what can be done with them. Of course, as I say, I wish I could come up with a new effect, which I don't expect to do in my lifetime. Well, you so. came up with an awful lot of new ones. <laughs> well, a variation of various kinds. Yes, but... <laughs> and the, uh, the, brain, the brain, brainwave deck was... Uh, yes, yeah, uh, so well, that was a new... That was a, well, it wasn't a new effect. It was just finding a card. Somebody thought of that had been done in... That's true, in, yes. in, in, yeah. in the less obvious... and more obvious ways. But presented as a mind-reading... <laughs> but but, uh, but this was done under what you might call almost test conditions, uh, apparently. It was, a, it, was a, it was something, because usually to have a card thought of, you had to force it, so-called force a card, which uh, the, the average person who's trying to, to discern how the trick is done won't take a force card. But, I mean, uh, I, this brainwave was good for that reason. You found the card in a better way than it had been done before. But uh, I don't take any credit for any of these things. It's just because I fooled around with them more than a lot of other people. If I have the, these red cards and the black cards like that all together, now it stands to reason, when I riffle those cards together, riffle them together like that, and push them in, those cards are absolutely mixed up. But I, what I, I'm going to exaggerate. What I actually do is when I push them in, I push them right through each other. See, right through each other and pull them out again. But this is done rapidly and the cards are naturally back where they were before, see? The cards are all back where they were before. Now, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Look, if I do... Wait, there's one black one out, two black ones out of order there. Now, if I do this, push them through, let me show you that again. It doesn't matter. As I say, cutting has no bearing on the cards. But now, if I shuffle them like this, now, if I push them through diagonally and pull them out, they're going to be back where they started. But if I don't pu push them out, and do that, now they're lost, they're all mixed up. But that time, see, I did a swindle, because I, I didn't really do what I said I was doing, but apparently I did. You see, the cards are back. But that's a trick, that's not a skillful thing, that's a subterfuge, okay? <coughs> but there are many ways of, uh, many ways of, oh, here's an interesting thing, everybody that sees a magician, everybody that's seen a magician has seen them do a so-called color change. Now, color change, it's done this way. Uh, I'll stand up so you can see it better. I mean, a color change is this. By passing your hand over the card, you see, you change it. Now, Leipzig, years ago, used to do it by simply slapping the card. He'd slap the card and it would change. But there's another way. I mean, much easier. Why rub the card or slap it or anything? You can take any card. Now, for instance, this three spot. Instead of rubbing it, just pick that spot right off, see? Now, that's the easy way to do it. So on and so forth. I mean, this that's is That's beautiful. <laughs> Dr. Hooker was a chemist for the Rockefeller Foundation. And people who could not solve his method, I mean, they saw, he used to do it on Sundays. He'd give a con every now and again, perhaps twice a year, he'd invite a crowd of magicians over to his home, and he'd put on this rising card. Now, the effect of the trick was this. He would put the cards, first of all, he'd use his own cards, and he'd put them in a houlette. The houlette is a container for cards. He'd put them in this... Uh, glass roulette. They push them down in there. Now you'd call for any card you wanted in the pack and the card would rise from the pack. Now this was amazing because there were 52 cards there and anyone you call for would rise from the pack. You know, would rise, and he wasn't anywhere near. It would rise from the pack like that. Now, then, the real test, this didn't fool the magicians too much because there are many ways this can be done, but 
he would now borrow a pack of cards and, and without, <coughs> without spreading them out and looking at them, he'd take them from the lender, put them in the houlette. Now you'd call for a card and up would come the card that you named from your own pack. Now fellows would try to catch them. They'd take their pack at home and they'd put a card in backwards like this. They'd reverse it in the pack. They'd turn it upside down. And they'd give them this pack. They'd give them this pack to, to hold. Now when he put the cards in the container and they'd call for the Queen of Diamonds, that card would come up backwards, which proved that it was the actual card that, the pack that they gave him. Now this astounded people. I mean, they, they couldn't understand it at all. I mean, it's, but... They fail, they fail to mention when they talk about this trick one little difference. When he borrowed your pack, the pack was not visible in the houlette. It was visible at the time he put it in the houlette. But then he had a little screen that he'd stand in front of the houlette, a little screen like this. And in other words, the whole pack was out of sight. Then the card would rise. But right, always right. when you use your pack, he put the little screen in front of the card. But this, the only two people I understand that ever had the true working of this trick, and that's John Mulholland and, and Dr., uh, I can't remember his name, a doctor, a well-known doctor in New York. But anyway, he, uh, but everybody was fascinated by this trick, and they said, well, it must be chemical, because he's a chemist, and it must be chemical. I don't think chemistry had anything to do with it, but I, I, I have a inkling of how it was done, but I don't know the yeah, exact that's operation. fantastic. That's but fantastic. it really created quite yeah. a furor. Yeah, I read just... Uh, Dr. Hooker's Rising Cards. Yeah. Hooker's Rising Cards. And Dr. Hooker is a famous chemist, but he was much more famous among the magicians for the <laughs> Rising Cards than for his chemical effects. Than he was for the, the, for the <laughs> chemical effects. Uh, Herbert Brooks was a good magician. Herbert Brooks' he? son is living here in Los Angeles, uh, Ron Brooks, but Herbert Brooks now, with simple ingredients, of course, I know you've all heard the story about a man who, with a simple box camera, takes beautiful photographs, or a man with five basic tools, a hatchet, a wrench, and a saw, or a chisel, he can make wonderful things, but that's, it's, that, that's all right, but I think the workman today who has tools for every possible thing, he can just do a much better job. But, but here's a fellow, Herbert Brooks, that only had about five basic slots. He did them all well, and he created really miracles with a pack of cards, because he used them very judiciously, and he was a very, very good performer. But, as I say, the trouble with the, the young magician today is that he learns all kinds of slights and, and maneuvers and tricky things with cards, but he doesn't pay enough attention to the basic, the, the effect. In other words, he gets lost, uh, lost with all these yes. intricate things. And the, the effect created is, is, is just like a painter. I mean, you may use the finest Windsor Newton, I don't know paints anymore, but the finest colors in the world and the finest canvas. But if he, if he forgets to paint a good picture or create something, uh, well, he, he may use the finest tools in the world, but he, he winds up with nothing but a, a colored canvas. So this, it's the same way in anything. You've got to have your... What you want is the, is the finished thing, the, the effect at the finish. That's what you want. You don't want it. And who cares how many different paints or straight uh, straight edges or whatever you use. I mean, you know. Right. You've got to many of the uh, young current magicians in particular that I have seen uh, through the years here at the Magic Castle uh, handle cards, uh, many of them, so beautifully. Oh, they do. Now, they, just while you mention handling cards, you know, anybody... I don't know how some of these imposters are able to fool people. I mean, there's this story about this great imposter that formed, performed medi uh, operation, medical operation and everything. I don't know because, to me, you ought to be able to tell instantly, unless a person's a marvelous actor, whether, they're, whether they are acquainted with a craft, I mean, are skilled in the craft. Now, if you see a fellow pick up a pack of cards like this, the moment he picks them up, you know he doesn't know anything about handling cards, because people don't pick up cards like you pick up a piece of mud or something. They pick them up. I mean, they, their cards are picked up. They're not picked up like this. They're, they're just picked up this way. And another thing, if a fellow puts down cards and they're all sloppy, a good card handler always puts cards down with a neat block. And you see, there's a big difference in this. I mean, putting cards down, of course, it's all right. You want to be careless. but. If you're doing a neat trick and you say, now they're the cards, you put them down, they look so much neater and firm that way. What if you put them all sloppy? It's a different thing. And the same way when a person handles cards, if they hold their hands over them like this, they're butchers as far as card handlers are. You, you don't hold, hold cards like that. They're, they're, they have to be handled a certain way, the same way a good golfer will handle his club or a tennis player hold his racket. 
I mean, this is discernible instantly to anybody who's familiar with cards. You can tell by the touch. Same way when, when a person holds up a person holds up a card like this and says, "Look, now watch that card." Well, you know, you don't hold cards like that. You hold them at your fingertips, so you hold them. They're, they're fragile things. They're not held like this or like that or look at this card and watch that card. And yet you see people who say they're good with cards and they say, oh, remember that card, no? Well, you don't do that. I mean, a card is a... It's a very delicate, very pretty thing. thing isn't it? And you hold yeah. it that way. Like a flower. You don't hold a flower and crush it. You hold it up and show it. Let them get the odor. <laughs> the fragrance. Fragrance is in odor in a flower. There was a time when you used to do uh, a lot of uh, so-called uh, mind-reading mental... Uh, yeah, I, in fact, I had a, car a card years ago in New York. I had a card. You don't draw a card. You merely think of one. I had printed on the card. You don't draw a card. You merely think of one. Because I was quite enamored with the fact that you could let a person think of a card and find out what they were thinking of. Well, this is very... This is a psychological thing. Now, this is something that, uh, that takes a lot of training to do, and I used to do it quite well. And this, I mean, this is not an exposure, but some of the onlookers might like to try this sometime. This is really a beautiful thing, but it's got to be done a certain way. If you're talking and talking about something very interesting to somebody, you have them, you've got to have their attention. I mean, they've got to be listening to what you say and, and following it. In other words, I'm showing you a queen of diamonds, but I'm, I must not let you be conscious that you see that queen of diamonds. I've got to do get you so interested that I keep emphasizing a point, but I keep flashing this queen of diamonds on you. But if you once look and say, oh, there's the queen of diamonds, this thing's no good. I've got to get you so absorbed in what I'm talking about that you you see that, but you don't realize, subconsciously you see it, but you don't, you don't take any heed of it. Now later, if I put these cards down and I'll say, here's a funny experiment I'm going to do, and I look through the cards and I say, there are 52 cards in the deck. Now, when I count three, I want you to name a card, and you one, two, three, they'll say Queen of Diamonds. Now, but this is not easy to do, because you'll either overdo this part of showing them the card, or you won't hold their interest. But I used to be fascinated by this kind of thing. When and it's, I of course, a, a subconscious thing. And, yes, and I, I even did it on a, on a teacher one time, oh, at the Royal Military College in Canada, old Ball Zalek, he was our mathematical <laughs> teacher. And I was fooling around in the class uh, showing somebody a trick. And he called me up. He said, Vernon, bring those cards up here. So I brought them up here. And he said, I'm going to show you. He said, how ridiculous this, this, this tomfoolery is. He said, any trick you do, he said, by logic and analysis, he said, I will expose to the whole class here, any trick you do. So I, I said, I don't think you can. And I, I tried this on him. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, of course, I've got to do something that you won't understand at all. And I said, now, when I count three, you'll name a card. And boy, was I delighted when he named a card that I worked in the class. Yeah. And boy, he shook hands with me. He said, Vernon, you're diabolical. Go back to your seat. <laughs> he, he, wouldn't, he, didn't, he just gave up. And, uh, if I'd done some ordinary little card trick, he probably would have caught it and exp you know, That's exposed it. Yeah. But, I, but so, I was always interested in things of that kind. It's, because, uh, it's those are a, psychological. And my main interest in magic has all been for two reasons. One is to... It's a great insight into people's character. Now, some people, they'll enjoy a, a good trick and they'll laugh. They say, boy, I don't want to know how it's done. Gee, that, 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 give me yes. a thrill. It takes me back to Fairyland when I read fairy tales. It's great. Another fellow, oh, well, you must put it up here. Oh, well, you, their attitude is, well, uh, they, they, it's a challenge. They think they're not intelligent it's because they, they say, well, you slipped it up your sleeve. Oh, you got a trick pack of cards. It oh, makes you, them mad. They minimize it. it. Yeah, yeah, they get annoyed. And yeah. It's very interesting, the different types of people. Mm -hmm. And I've made a kind of a study of, of, of that kind of thing all my life. And the other reason I took up magic, because I've always been interested in the psychic and the, you know, the occult, and I thought if, if someday we, we do discover some real telepathy or real phenomena of some kind, I will have an advantage over other people because I've gone into it so deeply. Yes. And I would love to, to advance civilization, if you would say a little bit by contributing something in that respect, but I've looked and looked in vain. I've never you seen haven't found any, never uh, found any ghosts or phenomena. Uh, you haven't found I've any traced down a lot of these things and, you know, yes. now this Yuri Geller now that's going around yes. getting spoons. There's a young <laughs> fellow I met in Florida named Irv Weiner. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I've never seen Geller do this. I, in fact, uh, 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 Mary Ann Hooper wanted me to go on a program about a month ago on Sunday on the Today Show or, and, and discuss Geller. But I said, Marianne, I'd love to go, but I don't, I've never seen Geller work, so I can't discuss someone I've never seen work. Yes. I said, if I'd yes. seen him once, I'd be glad to. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's been astounding everybody, and yet 
this Herb Weiner, I'm sure, bends a spoon and is better than he does because there's no force used or anything. It just seems to be magical, but he does it by no yes. You don't think that a certain intensity in reference to thinking uh, a thought, uh, I mean, a thought projection in the reference to a if card you, is, I mean, if you could uh, uh, concentrate on that card and suddenly have a, the design change or something yeah, right. thought. Yeah, uh, it would certainly be fascinating. I mean, what hard to tell you, of what course, what the top you part do, is. What, what you could do if you, the mind could control an inanimate sure. object to the be. But as I say, the Russians are doing a great deal of research on this kind of thing. And you know, years ago, uh, Clayton Rawson, who died recently, he was the one that wrote the Scarney Dice book. You know, and hmm. he very he wrote footprints on the uh, murder in a top hat and footprints on the ceiling or something. But anyway, he was a very nice guy, and he wanted to send me down to Duke University. Yes. to play a hoax on, on Dr. Ryan. And I mean, in other words, to just to, not to tell him I was a magician, I mean to tell him that I'd been fascinated all my life because I had certain powers that I couldn't explain. And I, I know I wouldn't have any, any difficulty in fooling Dr. Ryan with some tricks. And I wouldn't do them as tricks. I'd say, well, Doctor, I don't sure. know. I, I just seem to know what the card well, is. Well, isn't this what Geller's doing? Well, uh, something like that. Yes. So, but my boy, Bob, I've got two very nice boys, and, and my... My youngest son, who's quite a scientist, he said to me, Dad, he says, you've never done any harm with your magic, have you? I said, I don't know what you mean. Uh, he said, well, he said, poor old Ryan, he's sincere at least. He might discover something. He might. And he says, you might set, set uh, civilization back a thousand years by doing it. He might discover something. He might be leading into something. And he said, you'd destroy the poor old man. He said, don't do this. And he said, so I took my boy's advice. I never did. But uh, would you have been? Uh, would it? Would it have uh, been? Would you have uh, felt? Uh, uh, would it have been hard for you to have done that? I mean, uh, would you uh, have? To, would you have been able to pull it off all right? Oh, I think without any trouble, <laughs> because I know I know people yeah. have conducted experiments for Dr. Ryan. He's very gullible. I mean, yeah. he's very naive. He 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 has faith in. The, he wants to. Well, he apparently wants to Stanford, genuine, and he, be, yeah. he he wants to accept it. You see, and he's anxious to. So apparently, Stanford research uh, has the same problem because Geller was up there for uh, a period of time, and I guess he kind of baffled uh, most of the scientists. Uh, well, this Randy there. from Canada, I haven't seen him, but they say he does it much better than Geller. But of course, Randy is pretty. But I, I, as I say, uh, Jerry Andrus, who, have you ever met Jerry Andrus? I, I know, he's from Oregon, isn't yes, he? Yes, from Oregon. Now, Jerry Andrus, uh, here's a very strange thing. He's an out-and-out -out atheist. But I never knew in my life anybody who lives more by Christian principles than, than, uh, than um, because everything he does, I mean, he, he won't even take a card like this, the Queen of Diamonds, if he's changed this card, and it's not the Queen of Diamonds, he's changed it for one of these other cards. He won't say, I'll put this Queen of Diamonds on the table, because he knows it's a lie, and he won't even do that. I said, but you're a magician, you take liberties with the truth, Jerry. He said, no. He said, and I won't do a mind reading trick. And I said, why? He said, because it furthers superstition. He said, if I fool people very badly, with a, I tell them it's mental, it's telepathy, you know, I tell them it's done by telepathy, and I'm successful, he says, they go away believing in telepathy. Now, he says, there's enough superstition in the yes, world. Right. He says, I don't yeah. want to be, you know, and he really believes that. Wasn't it you who better. said, uh, magic is the art of deceit? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly, certainly true. It's, a, it's a debatable whether the cups and balls or the uh, linking rings are the old, older trick. I mean, I, I think they both date back. Of course, this is of Chinese origin, the linking rings. Dates back to... Uh, now in the old days, are you, am I on? Yes, you are. In the old days, they used to use uh, six, what, Chung Nan Su, he used 16 rings. Some of them used 12. The standard thing they sell in stores sells eight rings. I worked the one with three rings, with four rings, five rings. But I finally settled for half a dozen rings. Now I'm using the same principle as used in the Chinese trick. And I have this small set of rings here, which I'll count. They're all separate and solid. And they're, as you can see, and I'm going to do this very slowly so you can follow exactly how it's done. Solid bands of steel. And just by rubbing them together like this, that one will link in the other. And they're solidly linked one in the other. And they come apart just like rings of smoke. Now, of course, there has to be an opening of some kind. There's not an opening, but there's a soft spot. You can tell by the sound, the clearness of the ring. Now, I'll just show you how you can 
right? Oh, I didn't get the soft spot. There it is. Now, of course, I'm not being perfectly honest. There's an opening through here, see? Now, if you reach through this opening and pull, you see the ring comes right up. Now, perhaps I'm working a little too quickly, so I'll do it very slowly this time. I'll take three rings and I'll try to link them in midair. There they are, linked in midair. Oddly linked. These can be thoroughly examined by a very sharp-eyed committee. Now, you see, it doesn't matter how many rings you have. If you keep up that twisting movement, you see, they link together. Now, if you want to get them apart, all you do is let them swing down like that. Swing down. Comes off. This one swings. And this one comes off. Now, I'll take, uh, I'll to pick up these three that are linked together here. I'll show you how the, they melt through each other. Now, of course, I'll put that on slowly by the twisting movement. Now those are solidly linked together. Now I'll show you how to link to get the rings together in eight different spots by reaching through like that. Now they're solidly linked together in eight different places. And they come apart by this twisting movement called the Chinese twist. Now you make a large size stirrup like this. You put this ring in here. And if you let them fall by their own weight, they'll all fall in the chain, six rings. If you take them this way, they all go on a single ring. Now every time I do this, I know what everybody thinks. They think there has to be an opening in this top ring. Now if there is, it'd have to be a pretty large opening to come through two inches of solid steel. But you see, it comes right out absolutely out and it goes right back again. Now some people still believe that some of these rings are permanently linked together because that's the way they try to imitate this trick in the magic supply places. But I'll show you each ring is solid and separate. I only have six rings so there's nothing to confuse you. Oh, <laughs> something happened here. Let me see. I got two. Oh, oh there they are. Wait, well, I didn't get them off. It never happened before. Something happened with these small rings. I'll put them all together again. All on this ring. I don't know what happened there. Let me see. I gotta take this ring off. Car oh, there it is. That's right. See, I didn't hit the soft spot. That was the trouble. Now I'll try to separate the ring. There's one. There's two. See, I hit the wrong soft spot there. You gotta hit exactly in the spot. That that's three. Now, this is this move that I told you, where you swing them like that, and then you, and you see they come right apart. That's all there is to that. 